So, I saw Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania last weekend, and I quite liked it. Besides Spider-Man, it honestly might be the best offering from Phase 4, maybe except for Shang-Chi. Of course, as with Thor Love and Thunder, even though I like the movie, I realize it has some flaws. I don't think it's as egregious as Thor, so the movie doesn't warrant a full rewrite in my mind, but I did want to highlight some of the issues I saw with the film's writing, suggest some tweaks, and talk about how to avoid such pitfalls in our writing. Most reviewers are super not on board with this movie. I don't just mean YouTube critics or quote-unquote serious news outlets. I mean pretty much every reviewer. The discrepancy between critic and audience ratings on Rotten Tomatoes is just wild. Eternals had a similar discrepancy, but not even by a margin as wide as this. Interestingly, most reviewers take issue first and foremost with the film's visuals. The Guardian called it an incoherent special effects dump, and the New York Times said it was busy and noisy. I think that's fair. I'm no professional filmmaker, but I am an English teacher, so the things that bothered me the most in this movie were all writing related. With that, let's just get into it, and obviously, spoilers ahead. Let's start with the characters. One of the first rules that any writer will tell you is that characters should propel the plot and not vice versa. Stories are based on characters taking action and learning something from that action. The movie really puts the wrong foot forward because the plot is set in motion by the antagonist's actions, making the protagonists purely reactionary. Kang sucks the ant family into the quantum realm against their will, Jumanji style. You might argue that Kang was only able to do that because Cassie was sending signals down into the quantum realm, but that was a decision she made off-screen before the actual story started. Also, before you tell me, I know, it was MODOK who said that he received the signal and he sent them into the quantum realm. But as a side note, if he could do that, why couldn't he just, you know, send them right where he wanted them? But I digress. Hi, it's me here in the editing bay. Sorry to interrupt. I just realized, if Kang can get the Ant family into the quantum realm, why doesn't that work both ways? Why can't they get out? How does the door only open on one side? Do they explain this in the movie? I feel like I'm going crazy. While we're on the subject of Cassie, let's talk about arcs. Remember how I said in my Thor video that stories are about characters and all literature is about what it means to be human? Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. This is Kang's movie more than it is Ant-Man's. If we're being honest, this movie should belong to Cassie. It should be about her relationship with Scott. The movie almost establishes arcs at the beginning, but those arcs are completely dropped. Cassie is set up as someone who's headstrong and wants to look out for the little guy. Scott is set up as someone who's trying to make up for lost time and regain his daughter's favor, being overprotective in the process. But both of these arcs are pretty much done away with. They're explored briefly, but never really resolved. Oh, also, there's no reason for Cassie to wait to put on her ant suit except for the reveal. The writers are so desperate for that reveal to be cool that they forego logic. So, here's how you fix the beginning of this movie. The ant family receives a distress signal from the quantum realm. Cassie, being headstrong and caring about the rights of the underprivileged, jumps into her machine to answer the distress signal. Scott, being just as hasty, jumps in after her. Janet, scarred from her time in the quantum realm, stops Hank and Hope from going in after them, but eventually the three go in as well, with a plan. This way, Cassie has made a choice, one that relates to her character motivation. Scott and the rest of the characters have also made choices in response, choices that just as well relate to the arcs they should have. As the movie currently stands, Cassie, Hank, and Hope feel less like characters and more like plot devices. Janet does have an arc, but it resolves itself in the middle of the story toward the end of the second act, so the hero's journey unravels and the character growth ends up feeling unsatisfying and unearned. Hi, sorry, editing me again. I also just wanted to mention with Janet, it's really cliche for her to not want to talk about the quantum realm, and it's even worse because, like, why doesn't she have a reason to talk about it? Nothing really happened to her. Why didn't they play up the fact that she cheated on Hank with Bill Murray, or maybe if she were tortured for the secret of the Pym Particles, you know, something she'd actually want to forget or have a hard time talking about. Sorry, just wanted to add that. Moving on. Anyway, I mentioned how this whole movie is basically just a promo for Kang, and honestly, Jonathan Majors totally killed it. But here's a question. If Kang can kill people just by pointing at them, why doesn't he just do that when he has a standoff with the protagonists? I swear, Marvel movies do this all the time. They oversell their villain, then nerf them when the hero has to confront them. 
check out Filmento's video on Multiverse of Madness for more on that concept. Sorry, editing me one last time. Just another thing I realized about Kang. He couldn't make Pym particles on his own, with all the technology he had. Not to mention he's from the future. I don't know, it just seems like he could have figured that one out for himself. If Darren, a 21st century scientist, could do it. Also, Darren is in the quantum realm. Does he not remember how to do it? It's just confusing. But when it comes to villains, I want to talk more about MODOK. I don't hate the decision to turn Darren into MODOK. I don't know what the general consensus is on that choice, but in my mind, it's not bad. My real issue is how the movie treats him like a joke. This is another thing that Marvel does all the time. Look, MODOK has always had a strange design, that's part of the charm of the character. But lampshading how dumb he looks is not unique, funny, or clever. Side note, lampshade hanging, or lampshading, is when writers call themselves out for something within the story. Lampshading is generally frowned upon because it's a lazy way to address the reality of a problem without truly solving it. Check out Overly Sarcastic Productions' video on the subject. Also, maybe I'm being a little overdramatic, but sometimes it feels like a slap in the face to Stanley and Jack Kirby to reduce MODOK to a joke. But as I said, maybe that's not fair since the character has taken a more comedic angle in recent years. Still, if that's the case, then the movie can't have its cake and eat it too. If the protagonists are going to treat MODOK like a joke, then the audience has no reason to take him seriously when the movie needs him to be a threat. This leads me into my next point. Taking MODOK as a joke is a big problem for me because it interferes with the Ant family's potential arcs. Think of all the interesting ways the protagonists could have reacted to seeing Darren again. It could have been really interesting for Cassie to still feel fear over this man who was the monster in her bedroom, or if Hank still felt regret over what he did to his pupil. But no, the whole thing is played for laughs. Oh, also, it's contrived enough when Cassie is just running from Darren and he keeps missing her, but it's worse when she pulls herself off a ledge, stands in Darren's sight for a while, and he just does nothing. Okay, that about does it in terms of characters and their arcs. Let's move on to stakes. The MCU's version of Ant-Man has been a character that's worked better in smaller stakes stories. I think I'm one of the few who likes Ant-Man and the Wasp because it's a more personal story compared to other entries in the MCU that seem too wide to the point that the stakes feel meaningless. But after Endgame, Scott has now saved the world. The movie tries to do something with this, make Scott seem big-headed after his Endgame experience, but as with Scott's other potential arc, it's not concrete and it isn't pulled through all the way. A good way to tell this story would have been Scott being in over his head, having to deal with a world-ending threat on his own, trying to keep Cassie out of it, and ultimately realizing he's not on his own. It might be a little predictable, but at least it's concrete. But moreover, it never actually feels like there are any stakes in this movie because none of the protagonists' lives are ever in danger. I pointed out how they have plot armor when confronting Kang and MODOK, so even though there are worldly stakes, there are no personal stakes. So, in an attempt to raise the stakes, there is one character who dies. It's a robotic character who looks like the robot from the Lost in Space 2018 reboot. I do not remember this character's name, and that's going to serve my point. Kang kills this character, and the movie plays it completely seriously, but I can't even remember his name. I had to laugh at that moment in the theater because it was such a nothing scene. I'm sorry, but killing a character I don't care about doesn't translate to stakes. In fact, there's not a single new character in this movie to care about. I don't remember any of their names. Don't get me wrong, I'm thrilled that William Harper Jackson could be in the MCU, but it kills me that he had, like, what, 15 lines? It's just disappointing. Now, last but not least, let's talk about pacing. I think this point will be shorter because it weaves into the points I've made previously. Before the characters enter the quantum realm, it's like the movie is doing an exposition speed run, and almost none of it pays off, as I've already mentioned. Then, once the protagonists are divided in the quantum realm, the cuts between them are too frequent and often unnecessary. Some scenes end up feeling artificially injected, rather than plot or character progressors. Oh, and as long as we're going to talk about exposition, there needs to be a smoother and, ideally, more unique way to deliver it. Mason, from the Weekly Planet podcast, actually kind of broke down the Marvel formula. The, the Marvel formula, we all know what the Marvel formula is. It is, there's a bad guy, and he wants to do a bad thing and or get a bad thing. Uh, and, and the good guys have to stop him. Yep. And they do so sort of via the medium of three to four large action sequences mm -hmm, that are strung mm -hmm. together with exposition and quips. 
right? And so I think the best of the Marvel movies, we get like exciting and innovative action sequences. We get quips that work with the characters. We get uh, exposition. Like it, it, they're all going to have exposition, but it's, but it's hidden in scenes in a world that seem real. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Honestly, what more could I add to that? Does that sound like an interesting way to tell a story? Action set pieces interspersed with exposition? There's one portion of exposition in this movie that kind of works for me, and another that definitely works for me. The one that kind of works is when Janet is telling her history with Kang. I honestly think this could have been better without the narration. Take out the middleman. As one of my writing professors said, don't spend a ton of time describing a character, just let them do stuff. Streamline that sequence as a flashback. The audience isn't so dumb that they need a narrator to hold their hand through that sequence. Nobody's going to forget that the sequence is framed as Janet telling a story to her family. On the other hand, the piece of exposition that does work for me is when Hank is describing how the ants that fell into the quantum realm became hyper-intelligent. The reason this works is that Michael Douglas is playing it completely straight, but if you listen to what he's saying, it's just so ludicrous. That's a funny and engaging way to deliver information. It could be better, sure, but it works within the Marvel formula if that's what Marvel is going to stick to. And I mean, hey, it's worked for them this long. Well, maybe it's starting to wear down. Okay, I guess that covers it. Sheesh, I uh, kind of tore this movie apart, didn't I? I honestly really do like it. Even if the characters' arcs don't reach completion, I still find them very charming. Moreover, I just really love the premise of Ant-Man and the sort of underdog status he's developed over the years. I think it's great that Kang is ultimately defeated by ants. I think there's something to be said about that. Something about nature always retaking itself, or defeat coming from where you'd least expect it, pride going before the fall. But maybe I'm reading too much into it. In any case, I hope you learned something about writing today. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the movie and my criticisms. Tell me everything, and keep in mind, ultimately, this is a rough draft.